Good morning, I am Susie James and uh, this is uh, a little video um, based on our service at my church yesterday, Abington Avenue URC. We have been studying um, a book called Fruitfulness on the Front Line, which is written by Mark Green, and I will be quoting from that book at various points today. Um, fruitfulness, as Christians, we're called to be fruitful. So there's meant to be things that are happening in our lives that will be visible to others. And actually, when you think about fruit, it's um, it's sustenance, isn't it? So it's meant to be beneficial to others um, that we create fruit in our lives. And we've done various different uh, services on this now. So this is part of a series and you can watch the other videos in the series um, by visiting our uh, Facebook page, Abington Avenue URC, or by visiting our website. And I will put that in uh, the comments below if you would like to catch up on that. So um, we have these six M's that Mark Green has come up with. And to help us remember what the six M's are, um, I thought we'll have some little kind of symbols to kind of remind us to jog our memories because it's easy to forget um, when you're doing a series and you move on to the next topic. Um, but the first one we had um, was to pretend to eat a piece of fruit. And that was to remind us to be fruitful. Uh, and then we pretended to use a hammer and a piece of wood, reminding us that we should be making good works. Then we had a, a heart shape to remind us that we should be ministering grace and love to those around us. And then last week I spoke in church about moulding culture. So we had a kind of piece of uh, dough, maybe Play-Doh or whatever, that we're moulding uh, the fact that we should be influencing culture. Um, and then this week uh, we have uh, our hands going out to be a mouthpiece um, because this week we're thinking about being a mouthpiece for truth and justice. So if you had been in the gathering, you would have seen my three beautiful children uh, doing a little reading, but um, they are at school today. And so I will read for them. And this story comes from the Old Testament and King David, who was the king of Israel, he had been um, chosen by God to take over from Saul. Uh, he should have been out fighting with his men in battle, but instead he was back at court and he saw a beautiful woman and he took her for his own, had an affair with her. She became pregnant and uh, when she told David this, he tried to cover up his sin by calling her husband, a soldier, back from the front line, getting him drunk so that he would sleep with his wife and think the baby was his. Uh, but Uriah was an honourable man and knowing that the rest of his soldiers were on the front line, he refused to go home to his wife because that would be unfair on them. Uh, so what did King David do at this point? He's like, there's no way I can get around this. It's going to come out. And so he sends a message uh, to the front line and says, put Uriah the Hittite out in the front line and then withdraw from him. And of course, Uriah was killed in battle. And so our story today is God wanting to challenge David about this behaviour, about this decision that he's made. And he uses a prophet called Nathan. The Lord was angry with King David, so he sent his prophet Nathan to speak to David. When he came to him, he said, there are two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveller came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveller who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. 
I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. Seven days later, David's attendants told him that the child had died. He comforted his wife Bathsheba. Some time later, she gave birth to a son and they named him Solomon. So quite a challenging story there. And uh, you can see how difficult it can sometimes be to be a mouthpiece for truth and justice. I wanted to start this morning by sharing something from the book that Mark uh, wrote. And uh, it's just to reinforce the fact that God loves truth. And um, there's a verse here that I'm going to share. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose way of life is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbour and casts no slur on others. That comes from Psalm 15, 1 to 3. Elsewhere in the Bible, it actually says that God hates lies. He hates a lying mouth. And of course, the devil is known as the father of lies. Now, if we're all honest, we can think of times when we haven't been truthful. And it's easy sometimes to go, I won't lie, when someone asks us to lie for them. I remember a time someone came to me and asked me to lie to get them out of um, a speeding fine uh, because they were quite young and they hadn't held their license for long. Them getting that speeding fine would mean they would lose their license for a period of time. And it was easy for me using one of the Ten Commandments as my uh, justification to say, I'm not prepared to lie for you. I won't admit to that crime that I didn't commit on your behalf. Um, and we can get perhaps on our little pedestals and feel a bit self-righteous about the fact that I won't lie. Um, and yet, actually, if we're honest, there are plenty of times when we lie, whether it's um, by leaving out the truth or twisting something, exaggerating something, uh, shaping our story to suit ourselves. And sometimes, like for Nathan, it can be difficult to speak the truth. Um, because we're worried about how people will respond to what we say and uh, it's not comfortable sometimes sharing the truth. Um, other examples in the Bible. Look at what happens to the prophets. Elijah may triumph in the end, but he spends more than three years in hiding. Micaiah, son of Imla, tells Ahab the truth. He ends up in prison on a diet of bread and water. Jeremiah says what God tells him to say, and he ends up socially ostracised, mocked, beaten and half dead at the bottom of a well. Stephen tells the truth and is stoned to death. Of course, these are extreme cases, but the reality is that even for people today, if they tell the truth, if they are a whistleblower in the workplace, they often find themselves no longer working for the company that they tried to protect. And on a personal level, we know that when we tell people the truth, sometimes when we challenge them, they won't necessarily uh, appreciate what we have to say. It's a risky business, but we're called to be mouthpieces of truth and justice. Our second Bible reading today came from the book of Colossians. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you might have great endurance and patience, giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. 
for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Now, interestingly enough, that verse doesn't mention either of our words today, truth or justice. I've been praying these words, not realising they came from the book of Colossians, because it was on one of the... Um, the settings I have on my prayer app, it came up as a prayer to pray for myself. And so I have been praying this on and off for months because it's so powerful to me. I can't really take in all that's in this verse. And yet in this verse is so much that we see we can't do this. We can't be a mouthpiece for truth and justice uh, without what God can give us. We need him to fill us with the knowledge of his will because sometimes let's be honest we don't know what to do we don't know what to say we don't know how to be a mouthpiece for truth and justice even if something isn't sitting right with us we need wisdom and understanding it says here that that's going to come to us from the spirit and when we do this we will live a life worthy of the lord are the words that we're speaking in situations worthy of the Lord. That is challenging. When we feel like we don't have the courage, we don't have the strength to speak out, we can be strengthened with this power because of his might. And when we're finding it difficult to persevere, it says here we can get endurance and patience from the Lord. Something else that struck me in, uh, in this book that I found really interesting um, was the fact that we won't always be successful. Now, Nathan was successful. He challenged David and David accepted what had been said, was convicted by what had been said, and he repented and uh, did what he could to try and make it right. Here, Mark Green says, sometimes our job isn't to win. Our job is just to run the flagpole sorry, the flag of truth up the flagpole. Sometimes our job isn't to win. You know, sometimes speaking up involves helping someone to see the situation differently. And it might take many people speaking out the truth. It might take many people speaking out for justice before we see change. It won't necessarily come in our lifetime. And, uh, and we have to accept that and just do what God is calling us to do, trusting him that he will take our word and bring a, a return from it. So just to go back to Nathan and David for a moment, there were different ways that Nathan could have approached David. He could have come to David um, as a husband. How would you feel if someone had done this uh, with your wife? He could have come to him as commander in chief of Israel's army and said, you know, you're not going to have many soldiers left if uh, if they find out what you've been doing. He could have appealed to him out of family honour. You know, you are a son of Jesse. Is this the way that a son of Jesse behaves? I think what comes across uh, is a wisdom in what Nathan has to say. And no doubt he prayed and asked God to guide him, to give him the words, just as Stephen um, asked him, uh, asked God to give him the words to speak. So in the end, uh, Nathan appeals to David in his role as judge asking him to rule in a case of theft, which on the surface has nothing to do with adultery, but is similar in its portrayal of the callous, willful, entirely unprovoked exploitation of a man by a rich one. It's important to see that when God sends Nathan to confront David, God isn't doing it to condemn David. He's doing it to liberate him from his guilt, to communicate the consequences of what he's done and to restore their relationship. Nathan speaks up, it opens David to a better future. The truth sets David free. Our goal should not be to win an argument or to beat the other person. Our goal should be the well-being of others to the glory of God. Wow, that's a different way of looking at it, isn't it? I think so often when we see things on social media, people would say, oh, I'm speaking out truth, I'm speaking out for justice. But what is their agenda? Is it out of a heart of love? 
You know, with our six M's, there's overlap here. So when we're speaking truth and justice, it needs to be ministering love and grace at the same time. Our goal uh, should be a positive one. When I was younger, I grew up in a friendship group of three. And in primary school, often they ask you to find a partner to work with. And when you're in a group of three, that can be a bit tricky because one of you is going to be the odd one out looking around for someone to be with. And so when my two friends would fall out, I wasn't really wanting to be the peacemaker. Uh, I was quite glad that one of them was in the mood with the other and could perhaps, you know, fuel this fire to make sure I had a pair for the rest of the day. But actually, being a little bit more mature now, as an adult, I see many times that people are angry and offended with others, fed up, and I will actively seek to be a peacemaker, to offer a gentle word of truth, to help people see things from the other's point of view. So there's many ways that we can be a mouthpiece for truth and justice. Um, some examples that uh, we are given here in our book, we could encourage uh, people in the, uh, the groups that we belong to, um, to try and be environmentally friendly, uh, to try and be just, you know, looking to use fair trade coffee and tea. Uh, we consider writing to our MP and our local councillor where we see that things that are being done are perhaps not uh, just not looking out for the needs of the poor. Uh, perhaps we want to contact television channels and others, you know, for example, challenging on the way that they portray women um, or other vulnerable groups. Um, and we could perhaps challenge our supermarkets about the things that they are stocking. Change may take time, but good change is worth persevering for. So we have a couple of uh, thoughts that Mark Green uh, leaves us with on this one. Um, thinking about our own front lines. Our front lines are where we find ourselves. If you are a stay-at-home mum, that's your front line. If you are retired, um, but someone who has to go into hospital frequently, that's your front line. If you are working in a care home, if you are a plumber visiting people's homes, that is your front line. We all have uh, front lines. We might have multiple front lines. Uh, and Mark just gives us some questions that we can consider. What unfairness or injustice or falsehood do you see on your front line? In what ways might you respond? And who might help? So I want to end this morning with a, a prayer for us uh, as we do this. Father, help me to love mercy. Seek justice and walk humbly before you on my front line. Give me ears to discern where falsehoods reign. Eyes to see where injustice has its roots. Wisdom and courage to cultivate truth and justice. For your glory may it be. Amen. And there, you probably heard my son in the background. He's um, doing his school from home today. And uh, he obviously needs my attention. So that's my front line. And I am going to go and, uh, and try and speak truth and justice whilst ministering grace and love. I pray that God would bless you also today.